So thank you for joining EnviroLogic, ERR, and Beacon Environmental, Inc. for another great technical webinar presentation. EnviroLogic and ERR have the honor to represent Beacon Environmental, Inc., Path of Soil Gas Services in Australia, Brazil, Central and South America, and Western U.S. and California. As representatives of Beacon, we have facilitated the design and implementation of many passive soil gas surveys in many countries for many repeat clients and look forward to helping you all in the future. Today's presentation is called High Resolution Screening to Save Time, Money, and Improve Your Conceptual Site Model. Harry O'Neill is the distinguished presenter. Uh, Mr. O'Neill is the president of Beacon Environmental Services uh, which is an accredited laboratory and field sampling organization that specializes in the collection and analysis of soil gas and air samples. Mr. O'Neill has managed soil gas investigations for more than 20 years, working on federal, state, and commercial projects throughout the United States, as well as internationally across five continents. Mr. O'Neill has been on the forefront of the acceptance of passive soil gas sampling technologies at the national and international level and has overseen the implementation of over 1,000 soil gas surveys. He is also the lead author of the recently adopted ASTM standard D7758, uh, which you can look up online. And it's titled Standard Practice for Passive Soil Gas Sampling in the Vado Zone for Source Identification, Spatial Variability, Assessment, Monitoring, and Vapor Intrusion Evaluations. So I'd like to hand over the controls over to Harry, Mr. O'Neill, and uh, Harry, you can take it away. Okay, thank you, Lowell. Okay, thank you, Lowell. And thank, thank you all for attending all today's for talk, which is on the value of collecting high-resolution data to more accurately and efficiently characterize sites and guide remediation strategies. In today's talk, which will take about 30 minutes to go through the talk, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards, we're going to discuss what is high-resolution data. What does that really mean? and the use of sorbent samplers to collect this high resolution and high quality data. Describe the passive soil gas technology that Beacon employs and the importance in using quality controls in both the sampler design as well as the analyses. We're also going to cover the benefits of high resolution site characterization and discuss that through two case studies which we'll provide and then wrap up with conclusions and opportunity for questions at the end. All right, Lowell gave a little background about Beacon Environmental. Uh, the company's been around for over a decade focused on providing site characterization solutions using sorbent technologies to guide our clients on where they should take soil groundwater samples, make sure that they are properly characterizing sites to focus their remediation. We provide our technology through the use of kits and we send them out throughout the United States as well as internationally having worked across five continents. Our staff has experience in providing these type of projects for both industrial and military applications, having done this for over 20 years uh, with collective experience, uh, working for not only with Beacon but previous companies as well. And if you've been doing this long enough, they eventually ask you to be the lead author on an ASTM standard, of which we had put in place in December 2011 on the application of passive soil gas sampling in the Vado zone. As, be, as uh, Lowell mentioned, we are a laboratory and we send out our services through test kits. And uh, our laboratory is accredited in accordance with the U.S. Department of Defense ELAP accreditation and ISO 17025. And we're accredited for U.S. EPA methods A260C, TO17, and TO15. These are mass spec methods, so we're providing data of the highest quality although we are screening sites to focus additional sampling. As of this slide and the next one shows, Beacon is the only laboratory to achieve DOD ELAP accreditation for A260 and TO17 for air analyses by the methods as the methods are written without any modifications. There are other laboratories who can do uh, accredited analysis of the samples, but they have modifications to their method, which means that they are taking shortcuts on the, the QC that's involved. Okay, so Let's jump into high resolution. If you've watched as much television or itself, there's an there's a ad campaign that's out there where the, the announcer is asking students, what is better, more or less? And what Beacon would contend is in the environmental industry, more also is better. Even the kids know, more is better. What we've found out is because of the spatial variability of subsurface contamination, 
there is a necessity for collecting as high resolution data set as your budget will afford the site. But at the same time, while getting more data, you want to make sure that you're getting quality data. And we'll be covering that in this talk of the steps that we employ to make sure that the screen data that we present is of the highest quality. So what is high resolution? This map here shows 90 foot spacing across the site, broad area investigation to determine where contamination is present and get the lateral distribution of it. So with this investigation here, you see that samples are placed on 90 foot spacing and we saw TCE showing up at uh, about half the locations with a cluster of the measurements at the highest levels in the southern, southwestern area, A14, A17, and as well as over on the east side. But what if there was a true high resolution where we get into a grid pattern that Beacon recommends 25, 30 foot spacing? You might see data like this. As you can see, the source area that's shown closer to the eastern edge would be completely missed with a 90 foot spacing. But when employing a 30 foot spacing, you get the high resolution data to really identify where contamination is present, make sure that you can focus where you take a limited number of soil and groundwater samples and focus your remediation where the center of mass contamination is. So with data sets like this, you're able to show that collecting more data is better. The way that we collect high resolution data is by using passive soil gas technology. As the EPA provided in a document stating that there's a need to collect effective data. And effective data is high quality screening data. Screening data that allows you to inexpensively determine where you have contamination, where you have the hot spots, what's the lateral extent of it, to focus where you take the intrusive samples and focus your remediation. And a passive soil gas technology meets those requirements of being able to collect effective data. Our sampler is shown on the left side of this slide where it's a borosilicate glass vial that contains sorbent traps. There's also other sorbent samplers available, such as the center two slides show using sorbent packed stainless steel tubes that are about three and a half inches long, one quarter inch in diameter, that are filled with one or multiple adsorbents to trap compounds. And they can be used both in a active and a passive mode. Active mode means you connect a pump to it. You pull a known volume of air across the sorbent bed, and then you analyze that, and you have a concentration. Or in the passive mode, where you hang it in the indoor air, and for indoor air applications, there's established uptake rates for the different sorbents that we use, and we can provide to you a concentration for indoor air contamination or ambient air contamination by sampling over a day, several days, or even a couple weeks, keeping these samplers out to get a time integrated measurement. There's other sorbent samplers that are available out there that Beacon can do the analyses for them, but for indoor air applications in the passive mode, we recommend using the stainless steel tube, which is the gold standard for passive sorbent samplers for measuring concentrations in indoor air. With these sorbent samplers, you're able to achieve lower detection limits because you can control the volume of air that's pulled across the sorbent tube or the length of time that it's exposed into the air you can achieve detection limits in the parts per trillion range. With our passive soil gas samplers, we send them out in easy to use toolboxes. Their toolbox has a handle, you carry it around to the site, going from one location to the other. Beacon sends them out custom prepared with the number of samplers that you need for your site. This toolbox is about 20 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches. So it's very small, compact, easy to use. And the kit is going to contain all the materials that you need to collect your samples, except for what you're going to be using to create the holes, whether it be a hammer drill with drill bits, a slide hammer, or an auger. Everything else that you need will be provided in the kit for collection of the samples. So what depth do you install the samplers? Samplers are typically installed in holes that are about two to three centimeter diameter that are advanced to a 30 centimeter to one meter depth. But the holes can be as shallow as 10 centimeter, where we've applied that on sites, or you can put them in holes that are advanced to greater depths, several meters, using direct push technology when you really want to maximize your sensitivity. So it's a versatile technology that allows for various applications in the field. An alternative is we have a completely non-intrusive approach, 
where you put the sorbent samplers suspended beneath a stainless steel flux chamber and gases coming from the ground surface, emitting from the ground surface, go into the chamber where the organic compounds are trapped on the adsorbents. This approach is very effective on sites that have a UXO, explosive concerns, or chemical warfare agent concerns, or if you want to identify the emission flux rate at your site for risk assessment purposes, you can apply this application. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more detail about beacon sampler that we're using for passive soil gas. As I mentioned, the sampler, it's small, as you can see. It's about two inches long. It contains sorbent traps inside of the sampler that are filled with hydrophobic adsorbent. And that's important. The adsorbent is hydrophobic, which means that you don't need to use a PDMS material or other membrane, which can act as a competing adsorbent. The sampler that Beacon provides is completely inert, except for the adsorbent that's inside of it. And that's important because you want to make sure you're looking at relative values from one location to another across the site. You want to make sure there's no competing adsorbent in your sampler that can bias the results. Our sampler is designed in accordance with ASTM standards 5314 and D7758. And the way we provide our samplers is that we have two sets of adsorbent traps inside of the sampler. We use two different adsorbents so you can target from vinyl chloride out to PAHs with one analysis. So you get a tremendous amount of information from each location as to what compounds are present there in the soil vapor. And the fact that we're using two sets of the sorbent traps in there allows you to perform a field sample duplicate or have a confirmatory analysis for every one of the sample locations. So you have complete control on the QC that you can employ on your project by having a field sample duplicate at whatever location you want to have that performed on. Routine compounds that are targeted with a passive soil gas survey are chlorinated and petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, also targeting TPH, whether we're looking for gasoline, fuel oil, jet fuel, diesel, or complex mixtures such as paint thinners or stoddard solvents. We provide our results in speciation of compounds, individual compounds that were identified, as well as totals, such as total petroleum hydrocarbons. And then for total petroleum hydrocarbons, we provide breakdowns appropriate to your, your project, such as C5 to C9 hydrocarbons, as well as C10 to C15 hydrocarbons. So you can see the range of compounds that are present in your site to give you further information as to what type of contamination you can expect when you take more intrusive samples. Additionally, with a passive soil gas survey, you can target heavier pHs. You can also target ketones and other water-soluble compounds such as 1,4-dioxane. Those compounds, while they're soluble in water, once they're in groundwater, don't want to necessarily partition off and go in the vapor phase. When you have soil contamination with ketones and 1,4-dioxane and other water-soluble compounds, you will have plenty of the compounds in the soil vapor that can be picked up with a passive soil gas survey. We can also target alcohols and nitroaromatic compounds, pesticides, and chemical warfare agents and a breakdown products such as mustard and nerve agents. And Beacon has identified mustard and nerve age in soil vapor, and as far as we know, we're the only company that has identified those compounds in soil vapor. Additionally, using a specialized sorbent sampler along with uh, different analyses, we can target mercury across the site because that element will go into the vapor phase. All right, with the passive soil gas technology, it meets the requirements of the EPA's call for doing a green site investigation, where you rely on information gained from a thorough preliminary assessment. And thorough preliminary assessment means high resolution data set that identifies target areas and site conditions through a minimally intrusive technique. So passive soil gas certainly meets that requirement. And in addition, with our technology inherently in the field, there's no waste that's generated from soil cuttings because you're just creating a hole to put the sampler in. And as well as when the samples come back to the laboratory, samples are analyzed by thermal absorption, so you have no solvents used at all, so there's no waste that's produced. So it's another inherent benefit of using a passive soil gas technology on your site. All right, once the samples are back to the laboratory, Beacon is analyzing them following the highest QAQC in the industry. As I mentioned, our laboratory is accredited for the methods that were used to analyze the passive soil gas samples. And that's using GCMS methodology, whether it be 8260C or TO17. 
and we're analyzing the samples following all the QC requirements of the method. Other vendors out there are taking shortcuts to provide data saying it's screening data. However, we say that we can do it following all of the requirements of Method A260C and TO17, and we do that for the analysis of our samples to produce that data that is of the highest quality. Those things include using internal standards and surrogates with all of our analyses and doing the daily checks, performing MDL studies, limited detection, limited quantitation studies. All those are included as part of your screening data that you are provided for characterizing your site. So you can have confidence that you are getting high quality data along with the high resolution data sets. Talking about the quality, as I mentioned earlier, we make sure there's uniformity with our samplers and that we don't use any competing adsorbents. The hydrophobic adsorbent that we have inside of our samplers is measured out using an analytical balance so we have precision from one sampler to another, which is extremely important. Other vendors out there and approaches just either extrude adsorbent into their material or just pour adsorbent into a vial, not taking the time to make sure they have reproducibility from one sampler to another. And this is a key part to Beacon's technology, which allows us to have the high reproducibility and have the excellent correlation with our results to soil gas, soil, and groundwater data. And this is demonstrated through all the field sample duplicates that we analyze, where we have the second set of traps analyzed to show the precision from one set of sorbent traps to the next. I want to also mention that Beacon Laboratory is accredited for field sample collection. We have gone through the process to accredit our procedures for how the passive soil gas and indoor air samples are collected using our sorbent technologies. And Beacon is the only company that has received this National Environmental Field Sampling Accreditation Program, which the Department of Defense in the United States is pushing for and expects more vendors and laboratories to obtain this accreditation to demonstrate that the data that's collected in the field was collected under a controlled quality system, as well as the samples being analyzed in the laboratory were analyzed in accordance with a controlled quality system. I want to note that the data that we report is in units of mass, not concentration. What we are reporting with our passive soil gas technology is the mass that was trapped on the adsorbents at each location, and we're providing individual compounds that were detected using mass spec analysis. And that data then is produced across the maps that are provided to us to show the distribution of compounds, the hot spots, the trends across the site, groundwater plumes moving. Based on that data, you then go in and take either active soil gas samples, soil samples, or groundwater samples to get concentrations that are present there. Keep in mind that reporting the data in units of mass meets the project objectives of characterizing a site and the guide where you want to collect the limited number of soil, groundwater, or active soil gas samples and where you want to focus your remediation. All of those requirements are met by reporting the data in units of mass. When we want to have units of concentration, then we recommend using our sorbent tubes with pumps so you can pull a volume of gas across the sorbent tubes and be able to provide to you the concentration. The way that's done is you have the mass that is absorbed on the tubes, you have the volume of gas that's pulled across the tubes, so you have mass or volume, you have concentration. And so by using those tubes, we can have a very sensitive approach to report the concentration data to you. And often what we do is provide the first, the passive soil gas survey to focus where you need to set up a limited number of vapor ports, which are more time consuming to set up, and then get that active soil gas data. You're all probably familiar with using sumacash as well as using assortment tubes. And while no technique is perfect, I want something to consider is that there are some studies out there shown using sumacasters, and this information was provided by uh, uh, EPA and others, uh, including Air Toxics and Blaine Hartman, at the AEHS conference in 2012, where they show the results from uh, a proficiency test study using sumacasters, where they spike a known concentration of a compound in canister, brand new canister, send it out to different laboratories. And as you can see from the results, the numbers were all over the place from negative 33% to positive 168% of the true value, and negative 56% to 131% of the true value in another study. And you can see the other one as well. So there's, there's some challenges using sumic canisters, and one of the reasons is because you're collecting approximately six liters of gas inside a canister, but only taking an aliquot of that for analysis. Keep in mind, if you have 
10 ppb in that canister, that's only a total of about 60 nanograms that's present in the canister. It has to be perfectly mixed to be able to get an aliquot sample out of it and analyze it to get the accurate concentration. So something to think about when you are um, looking at your soil gas or indoor air data, how it was collected, making sure that you're using an accredited laboratory. It's extremely important. All right, let's discuss the, the benefits of high-resolution site characterization. Obviously, more is better as long as you're getting quality data. But can, how much data can you collect is always going to be determined based on the budget as well. But by employing a passive soil gas technology, which has a relatively low cost per analysis, but also has a significantly lower cost for sample collection, you're able to get more sample locations than you would with just a traditional approach where you come right in and start taking soil borings or do MIPS or some other intrusive technique using larger equipment, more labor intensive to collect samples. And then has more cost in the laboratory because you're taking soil samples, you're taking it at different intervals as you're going down to groundwater, so you have multiple samples from one location. Whereas with a passive soil gas, you have one sample at each location. So the idea is to use a high resolution data set to minimize the number of more expensive soil groundwater samples that are required and to make sure that the use of wells is for monitoring and not for investigation at your site. All right, so let's, let's demonstrate the, the value of, of this high resolution data sets. We're going to present two case studies here. The first is a former metal fabrication facility where contamination was identified in, in groundwater. The facility had a metal plating operations on site. In addition, they pretreated their production wastewater. So there's opportunities for solvents to be released. And the facility had been in operations for almost 50 years. The client had come in and what they thought delineated the groundwater plume with the installation of several wells. And so then the state wanted them, the regulatory agency wanted them to come in and take soil samples to identify where the source area was. We should note that the soils were clay, silt, saprolite, and the Vado zone was greater than 40 feet thick. This map here shows the locations where the wells were installed and where the soil samples were collected. The wells are in, in, indicated by MW and they're in green, and the soil sample locations are indicated by GP in a purple color. As you can see with this data here, PCE was identified in the groundwater, at concentrations ranging from 5 ppb to 3 ppm. So there was a wide swing in the concentrations. And then further southwest, there was even higher concentrations that were identified, which were from a separate source. But the focus of this investigation is what was going on beneath the facility that impacted the groundwater immediately beneath the facility. So you see the locations MW3 and 2 beneath the facility have those measurements of TCE as well as PC and other compounds showing up in groundwater. So the regulatory agency asked them to then go in and take soil samples. And they took soil samples down to the groundwater at different intervals. And what we're going to present here are the results that were found in the soil samples for all soil samples. Now, as this first slide shows, at location GP11, that was the only location that reported any of the target compounds in a 0 to 12 foot interval. And what they saw there were some xylenes showing up at GP11. All the other locations were non detects from 13 to 30 feet, xylenes also showed up again at the adjacent soil sample, GP2. And then we're seeing a little bit of cis-1,2-DC in the soil sample at location GP1. Still, no source areas are showing up by all these soil samples that are being collected. And the final interval, interval from 30 feet to 40 feet, two locations reported TCE. We're finally seeing TCE in the soil at very low concentrations, though as likely we're seeing some kind of impact of the soil that's from the groundwater fluctuating up and down that has smeared the soils and, and contaminated them. So based on these findings, there was no identification of the source areas. They had no indication of where they should focus their remediation and where they needed to uh, take any additional samples or put additional wells in. So the client had experience using passive soil gas and recommend to the regulator to apply a high resolution data set across the site to really get a handle with one investigation as to what's going on at the site. So they applied an approach which used 15 foot spacing on the east side where there was higher possibility of having releases because the location of the plating room, where they were treating the wastewater, and also where the paint booth was located. 
and then they spread out the spacing to about 40 foot in areas further to the west and north. And then put additional samples up on the northern end where the former TC sto storage area was. So what did they find? They found source areas. What we see time and time again is that soil samples are not going to be sufficient often to identify when you have soil contamination because you're missing a location where a majority of the contamination is present, and that's in the pore spaces beneath, between the soil. So what we saw out there was there was 60,000 nanograms of TCE identified on the one location in the south end of the building, near or at least the south end of the grid, near the paint booth. Keep in mind that 60,000 is one, two, three, three orders of magnitude greater than our reporting limit, and four orders of magnitude greater than our detection limit. So high levels are present out there as it relates to a passive approach like ours, which has great sensitivity. So what else was seen out there? We also saw CIS-12-DCE, 11-DCE, tetrachloroethene, which is probably an impurity in the TCE that was used, as well as vinyl chloride. So we were seeing with the passive soil gas survey the primary contaminant of the concern, which is TCE, but we were also identifying that there is attenuation of the compounds. There is breaking down of the compounds to all the way to vinyl chloride at the site. And in addition, we saw xylenes out there. You remember, we saw that as a GP11 and GP2 had xylenes showing up in the soil samples. The passive soil gas data confirmed that as well, that xylenes are present there in abundance in the area near the wastewater treatment and plating room in between there. In addition, we saw 1,4-doxane showing up. This compound was not known to be a problem out there. It is an emerging contaminant of concern because of its water solubility. We're seeing it often at sites that have 111 trichloroethane as well as trichloroethene. And this really has the attention of the US EPA because there's lots of sites where it was not targeted and it might be a concern out there because it's gonna be much more water soluble than the other chlorinated compounds and so will migrate away from the site much more rapidly. So the, having a technology that can identify 1,4-doxane while identifying all the other compounds is very important. Yes, 1,4-doxane is water soluble, but when it's present in soil, it produces compounds in the vapor phase at sufficient mass for it to be picked up with a sensitive technology like ours. So from the findings from the survey, the passive soil gas survey located the source area within the building and focused where a nest of three wells was going to be placed. It gave the clients the information they needed to, to place those wells at the most appropriate location instead of just trying to guess where it should be placed based on operations that occurred at the site. And with a site that's been in operation for 50 years, it's not likely you're gonna know where all the operations occurred. In addition, we found other areas of interest at the site which required additional sampling and eliminated a lot of areas that do not require additional sampling. Further, with a clearly identifying the hot spots of the site, the client is able to go right in and start evaluating what mediation technique is going to be the most appropriate at the site because they know where the center of mass contamination is. And as we discussed, 1,4-doxane was also identified. It's going to affect their remediation strategy and how they handle that contaminant to make sure it's not migrating off site. All right, quickly, I want to do a, a second case study, several slides here, to discuss the use of the passive soil gas to not only identify source areas, but track groundwater plumes. And I want to mention that both of these in, uh, case studies here are focused on chlorinated compounds. The passive soil gas technique has very good affinity for targeting petroleum compounds as well. We do lots of work at sites that are gas stations, bulk storage petroleum facilities, as well as sites that have both chlorinated and petroleum compounds present. All right, so at this site, the state regulators identified through their monitoring that there was a well that was impacted with tetrachloroethene at 6.8 ppb, just above the, uh, the MCL at the site, but they needed to determine where the source area was coming from. It's an urban environment, as you can see from the map there, lots of streets, lots of residential and business in the area of the well, and there was multiple potential source areas that were present, such as automotive repair facilities, manufacturing facilities, as well as dry cleaners. So gaining access to all these properties was very challenging. And we're looking at low concentrations in the groundwater, which is five meters below grade. 
So working with the client, we established a sampling plan that involves 74 passive soil gas samplers. And we use the samplers in public right-of-ways to sample near the potentially responsible parties without having to get site access because, it's, you know, it can be a nightmare trying to get all parties to agree before you can go in and take all your samples. So we just sampled along the streets between the sidewalk and the street with our passive samplers. We used approximately 30 meter spacing along the streets near the uh, PRPs that were further north and not of as much concern. And then we tightened up the spacing near the dry cleaners. There was a former and active dry cleaner that was in closer proximity and believed to be a greater likelihood of being the source of the contamination. The next slide shows a close-up of the southern area. You can see Monitoring Well 1 on the right side of the map where the PCE was identified. And on the left side of the map, you'll see where the arrow is pointing to the former and active dry cleaners. It's about an 800-meter distance between the dry cleaners and the monitoring well. And this is the findings. The passive soil gas survey clearly identified that both dry cleaners had releases of tetrachloroethane and that the contamination was migrating over to the monitoring well. In addition, all those points to the north were all non-detects. So we were able to exclude out all those other PRPs without having to go into their property and take any samples. Of interest, the dry cleaners released tetrachloroethane, and that's what we saw showing up in the soil gas samples that were collected next to them. And as it moved along the street to the east towards Montreal Well, we were seeing tetrachloroethane. But when we got near Montreal Well 1, which was close to a gas station, we started seeing petroleum hydrocarbons also showing up in the passive soil gas data, as well as trichloroethane, cis-1,2-DCE, 1,1-DCE showing up in addition. So we were seeing with the passive soil gas survey where the release of the PC occurred, its migration pathway over to the impacted well, and that attenuation was occurring by the well because there was an additional petroleum release that was identified from the passive soil gas survey. So a lot of information was gained from that investigation and really helped the client and the state figure out where they need to focus the remediation. This map here shows the GRAB groundwater samples that were quickly uh, taken after the passive soil gas survey to confirm the results from the, the soil gas survey. And what they found out there was that both of the, uh, ground, the groundwater beneath both of the facilities was highly contaminated and the plumes coming from the facilities were migrating over to the well and that they were, the plumes were commingling. So what did we see out there? We saw non-detects, as mentioned. We, we excluded those areas that didn't require any additional sampling. But in the hot spots, we saw measurements as high as 29,000 nanograms showing up in our passive soil gas samplers. And when they went back and took groundwater samples, that equated to 17,000 ppb in groundwater. That being said, where we had passive soil gas samplers near the impacted well, which had 6.8 ppb in the groundwater, we were still identifying 125 nanograms with our passive sampler. So you see the trend from the, from the hot spots to tracking groundwater contamination. And keep in mind that the 125 nanograms equates to that 6.8 ppb in groundwater. However, our detection limit is still an order of magnitude lower than that. It's an extremely sensitive method. The ability to sample in the public right of ways gives you a lot of power to go in and investigate sites without having to work through getting permit and access agreements with all the multiple parties that you'd want to sample to identify who the sources are. And going back after the passive soil gas data, the client was able to just collect a minimal number of ground, grab groundwater samples to refine their conceptual site model and significantly reduce their investigatory costs. So in conclusion, a true high resolution site characterization plan significantly increases the probability of identifying whether source areas are present and better defines the lateral extent of contamination. What we find because of the spatial variability of subsurface contamination is that more is better, but as long as it's done by collecting quality data. Further, the use of groundwater and soil sampling approaches to characterize the sites often is going to mislead you and not going to have sufficient data to identify sources and also to misidentify where the sources are. You might take a data set out there with soil samples and you might see some contamination. However, you likely did not have sufficient density across your site and where you think the source area is based on your data set is not the actual source area at the site, which would have been realized with a higher resolution data set. 
it's important that you use quality sorbent samplers along with a quality analytical method to make sure that you're getting data that best reflects the subsurface contaminant concentration. Because all the data that we're collecting on the front end to characterize a site is going to be used for many decisions going forward. Where you collect your soil samples, where you install your monitoring wells, where you focus your remediation. And without getting that quality data on the front end, you could be going down the wrong road. The sorbent technologies are able to target those broad range of VOCs and SVOCs with one analysis, employing an easy to use technique where we send out the test kits for you to collect the samples yourselves and send it back to our laboratory where we're analyzing it in accordance with our accredited method. So we're able, working with you, to collect effective data that will refine your conceptual site model and guide your remediation strategies. So with that, there's about 30 minutes as hoped and I'd like to open it up for any questions that you have um, on the use of our technology and passive soil gas to characterize sites, making sure that you are getting a high resolution data set and focusing your soil groundwater sampling and your remediation. So Lowell, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Harry. That was a very good presentation. Um, so we're now open for questions and uh, to get things started, uh, Harry, I'd like to ask you to comment on uh, Beacon's ability to test and uh, the report on ticks and what describe what ticks are and, and, and how it can be used for, for site, different sites. Sure, uh, that's a great question, sure. and that's a great question, and it's a it's one of the it's benefits of, the of using benefits of mass using spec analysis, mass spec analysis uh, with the uh, A260 analysis, analysis. You're able to um, do the analysis for target compounds, as well as use the NIST spectral library to report tentatively identified compounds. So basically what we have is with the NIST library by using mass spec analysis is we can, for any peaks that show up on our chromatogram, which were not in our calibration, they're not known, we can compare them against the ion spectra from the library. And that library will give us a identification of the compound. And so we're able to report what it is at your site that might not have been known to be present, known to be targeted, but still is out there at the site. And we do it for lots of sites where there's just not a lot of information available to indicate what should be targeted? What was the historical operations out there? What legacy contamination remains? So by using the ticks, you have the whole wealth of the library from the NIST to identify what compounds are present at your site. Is there an extra cost for that? How, do, how does that determine? Yeah, there, there is an additional cost reporting ticks because there's an additional effort that is um, gone through to analyze each one of the samples. And it's typically about a 20% surcharge on the analytical cost to report ticks. And as well as ticks, we can also report um, high level data packages for Department of Energy facilities in the United States. Often they need to have a full CLP data package with uh, summary forms of all of the QC checks that were employed along with the analysis of the samples. And because we are doing the analysis at the highest level, we can produce those data reports that often are required to meet the data quality objectives of your project. Thanks, Harry. Do you want to uh, read, read, can you see the questions from uh, some of the attendees? I do, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah. The, first, yeah, the mm -hmm. question here is, can high resolution identify former MGP site contaminants, especially TARS? We have employed uh, our technology on MGP sites, and if you go to our website, there's a case study that you'll see on there where we use a high-resolution uh, data set to really focus where releases occurred. One of the nice things about using a passive soil gas technology like ours for these type of facilities is there's lots of underground piping, and the ability to only create shallow holes such as 30 centimeters gives you uh, the ability to collect data a lot more rapidly without presenting the opportunity to run into any underground features. And we can target BTEX, naphthalene, um, chlorobenzenes, uh, biphenyls, all can be targeted with a passive soil gas survey. And we will see cresols showing up as well when they're present in sufficient concentration. 
Obviously, when you get to heavier compounds that don't have as much of a vapor phase, we are relying on the those uh, compounds to produce the vapor to come up to our sampler. So if the contamination is getting too deep and the, we don't believe that the contaminants are going to be in the vapor phase coming to the near surface, we're going to suggest that we do a pilot study first to see if it will work at your site. But we've had very great success in working on MGP sites and other sites that have heavy coal stars. So the next question we have here is how do you fine-tune the length of time the samplers are deployed? And uh, that's an important question because it's all going to be dependent on the objectives of the site, the compounds that we're targeting, and the depth of which we expect the contaminants are present. As a rule of thumb, we're using about seven days of exposure for our samplers. And then that's going to be reduced or increased depending on what the objectives are and what we're targeting. If we're looking for source areas only, and say we're sampling beneath asphalt and concrete surfacing, where you're going to have an elevated measurements in the vapor phase, samplers can be out for just a day or a couple days. That's going to be sufficient. But the reality is often we are sampling for source areas as well as targeting the lateral extent of the contamination, getting down to lower levels, down to MCLs, and tracking plumes. So it's necessary to have a robust system that can handle having high levels of compounds showing up on a sampler while other samplers are having non-detects or seeing trace levels from groundwater. So when our objectives include tracking groundwater contamination where the contaminants are at depth, we'll leave the samplers out for 14 days. At times, we've even left them out for longer to make sure that we have the sensitivity to meet the objective of tracking the plume. We know that with our samplers, the tremendous surface area that they have on the, the absorbent traps, they look small, but there's a tremendous surface area for absorbents for holding hundreds of thousands, not millions of nanograms of target compounds on the absorbent. And so we will handle that back in our laboratory during the analysis to make sure that we can report your source areas as well as track the groundwater plumes. The question is, what is the lowest level of mass that you can detect for VOCs, SVOCs, and mercury? The detection limits of our samplers, and which are determined through proficiency tests and limit of detection, limit of quantitation studies. In the limit of detection, limit of quantitation studies, we have to perform those quarterly. For the uh, VOCs and SVOCs, our standard reporting limit is 25 nanograms, a limit of quantitation, 10 nanograms, and our limit of detection is 5 nanograms. For mercury analysis, our reporting limit is 25 nanograms. So that means that these samplers need to be out there, they're going to be out there for several days, if not weeks, and that we only need to trap that much mass on the adsorbent to have a positive identification. So a very sensitive approach to being able to see low levels, trace levels across the site. But when there are source areas present, we can distinguish between higher levels of contamination, even higher levels of contamination, and smoking hot high levels of contamination by the magnitude of measurements that we are reporting. We'll see four, five, six orders of magnitude differences from stream source areas down to our reporting limit. If you have any more questions, just please uh, submit them through the chat window. I want to make sure that, you, uh, that I mentioned that when we provide our technology, we provide the kit to you, you use it to install the samplers and return them back to us for analysis. For local sites, Beacon can also get involved with doing the installation or leading a team for doing the installation of the samplers. We have HAZWOPER trained personnel for doing that. But once the samples are returned to our laboratory, we analyze them. And then for what we report back to you are tabular results and a comprehensive report that also has a summary of the field procedures, the lab procedures. It has a description of the QAQC that was followed and its findings. And we also produce those color isopleth maps that you saw during the presentation. Those are maps that Beacon produces routinely in our reports at no additional cost. It's part of our service. So you have a valuable data set from day one when you get the samples back, the data back, to know where you need to focus additional soil groundwater sampling and remediation, and you have those maps to present to your client to show them where the red is and where they need to uh, focus their additional work. 
we have a question that came in that do you need to get permits from DOT or others to place samplers on public right-of-ways? Yes, what we found is that you often had to get, they have had to get permits for those who are doing the installation, whether it be through the city or the, the state. Uh, the DOT might get involved also. I haven't seen that as much as where they're just getting the municipalities that you give them access to be able to create a hole uh, in those public right-of-ways. But obviously it's a great question. You still want to do a utility clearance before you start installing the samplers and get permits before you install them. Another question of what is the maximum depth of groundwater that this is effective? We have seen contamination from as deep as 200 feet below ground surface coming up from contaminated groundwater to the surface. Now, we don't make a living trying to track contamination at a 200 foot depth, but we have identified that at sites where they obviously deep groundwater and there's very dry, uh, porous, sandy soil conditions. We just completed a survey late last year where we are tracking groundwater contamination at 75 foot depth using our passive samplers that were installed in holes approximately three feet deep. And there we were tracking a plume, and that was the only objective, not to identify source areas, but track the plume using transects. And it was a two-phase approach where we first put transects going uh, perpendicular to the groundwater flow to determine the what we saw as an extent, and then to tighten up and then put the transects parallel to the groundwater flow. And they found from both surveys to have excellent reproducibility and identifying contamination, which is known to be at a 75-foot depth. This is going to be dependent, of course, also on your geology. If you have clay soils, the extent of capability is going to be reduced. We have seen contamination below 30 feet below ground surface in tight soils in the southern United States. Um, in those conditions, the soils were dry. The most challenging soils is when you have tight geology along with water filling the pore spaces. That significantly reduces the, the uh, gas movement through the pore spaces. And that's where it all comes down to, is gas going to move through the, the pore spaces and come up to our sampler? Our experience has shown that there is a significant capability for gases to m migrate through, but it's important using a technology that can see trace levels. That's why active soil gas often is not able to pick up contamination at depth, but a passive technology will because we're leaving the samplers out and get a time integrated measurement over several days, several weeks to achieve that sensitivity. Another question came in on the cost per sample. The cost is going to depend on what compounds we're targeting. Uh, routinely, if we're targeting a list of VOCs, cost is going to be $185 per analysis, which includes the, the, the reporting as well. And then there will be additional costs depending on where the samplers are being shipped and shipment back to the laboratory. Costs can also go down if we are limiting the list of compounds that we're looking to target, or we're talking about a volume of samples, over 100 samples, uh, that, that will help bring the cost down as well. So, one thing to keep in mind is that cost is for the analysis at a location, and we're screening out a whole column, typically down to groundwater with one analysis. So if you're doing a comparative cost for the passive soil gas analysis by GCMS to, say, soil sampling, soil samples, you're probably going to take several soil samples at different intervals down to groundwater, and you'll have multiple analyses per location. And there's additional cost savings built in because of the simplicity of collecting samples. You're able to collect samples a lot more rapidly uh, with the passive soil gas technology than going out there and taking soil samples or installing wells, obviously, or even collecting active soil gas where you have to develop a vapor port and test it and make sure there's no tramp air being pulled down through helium leak checks to verify that you have a valid sample that you're sending back to the laboratory. So there's inherent cost savings both in the, the field collection as well as the analysis. On that, how many samples can be collected in a day? Uh, routinely, we recommend you're going to be, we guide that you're going to be able to collect approximately 50 samples per day, going out there, drilling, using a hammer drill to create a hole down to three foot, one meter depth, and installing the samplers. And that's including that some will be through asphalt or concrete surfacing. Once you become proficient at this, you'll be able to put 
50 samplers out in one day and all through concrete surfacing. Uh, we've even had projects where we put over 100 samples out in one day using a hammer drill to create holes and put our samplers out. So you can get significant throughput during your mobilization at your site to collect samples rapidly, both during the install, and then you do have to come back for retrieval, but the retrieval goes even more rapidly. Time to collect samples is about half the time it takes to install them. So we're coming up on the, uh, the hour here. Uh, are there any more questions out there that I can ask, answer for you at this time? Well, thank you, Harry. I think that uh, wraps it up. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to do the presentation. I thank everyone for taking the time to attend. Um, we'll be providing the recorded uh, a link to view the recording of the webinar um, in the near future, and we'll send it out to all registered attendees. So. Um, I think I will wrap it up now and close it off, and uh, thank everyone again, and you all have a great day. And then thank you all. I appreciate then, your time. Thank you all. And I appreciate your time and interest. And uh, please contact and, uh, us. Please contact the, us. Uh, phone number shown there. Phone number shown there. Or go to our there, website, or go to our website for, additional information. for additional information. We'll be glad to discuss we'll with you the application of our, of our technology and evaluate whether it makes sense for your site and how it best can be applied. So thank you again, and uh, thank I look you again, forward to hearing from you.